Okay, I'm Stephen Rose. Hello, Stephen. Sorry. That's fine. Um, I'm the customer director at Transport for Greater Manchester, which is getting quite a lot of mention today, isn't it? So I'm one of the people that uh, Andy and his team very much rely on to develop and deliver over the next few years the sorts of improvements that he's been talking about and of course the things that we do today because we've been around and are, and are doing a number of different things so thing, activities like ticketing customer services some of the cycling and walking activities that have been mentioned are areas I'm responsible for within TFGM so thank you very much for the invite. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm John Hannan, I'm the Programme Manager for Ambition for Aging here at uh, GMCDO. But what seems like almost another life ago, I used to run a transport um, resource unit project here at GMCDO for a number of years, helping to support community activities related to transport, also community transport operators as well. Thanks, John. Celia Oakley, I'm the Inspector from Greater Manchester Police, heading up the Travel Safe Unit, which is a partnership working with Transport for Greater Manchester, the Metrolink, First Bus and Stagecoach. Wonderful. I'll kick off the one. Well, I think in, in big picture terms, what Andy has talked about, about bus services, about train stations, absolutely sets the vision. And, and for a, an organisation like, like TFGM, it's fantastic to have uh, such leadership and an ambassador to be able to take forward some pretty big, challenging things. So changing the way our bus services operate is not simple. It probably would have been done by now. So there's, there's, there's a great sort of vision there about a number of things. I suppose my take on that is also though, that there's a lot that we can and are getting on and doing anyway. Um, and certainly with Metrolink in terms of the design of transport, um, a great deal of, of work, that's the, that's the area we've got most control over, um, about tram stop design, um, about information, they're the things that we can be getting on and are trying to improve now um, and make at least a, a number of modest improvements about information. Um, we've talked and Andy talked about um, Oyster style and joined up ticketing. Well, certainly for Metrolink, we're going to be able to do, we hope later this year and into next year, at least a few steps in the direction of something that's more joined up, that's easier, that's contactless. So there's things we can and are getting on and doing. I can give other examples as well. They're all, of course, complementary to a much bigger vision. Um, so a lot of those things will take a few years to put in place, but there are things we're doing. There are, there are in new interchanges. We're gradually working around Bolton being the most recent one, uh, uh, rebuilding interchanges. Big challenges are at the few who haven't yet been redeveloped, such as Stockport, for example, um, and Tameside. So there's a number that we're working on and doing those things that we've got most control, influence and the funding for because inevitably we are funding constrained and we have to prioritise what we can do. I'll leave it to that. Okay. Um, I think it's actually looking at the journeys people need to make and redesigning and rethinking those journeys and thinking about the places that transport exists in. So I've just seen um, Yasmin at the back of the room and some of the work that happened in Bolton uh, where getting residents to highlight there was a big issue with a, a pedestrian crossing and TFGM engineers came over and changed the sequencing on that crossing because it was almost having a kind of chasm in between a health centre uh, and a, an estate nearby. You can have the best transport in the world, but if you can't get across the road to the bus stop, it, the transport may as well not be there. So think about that first hundred yards or the first few hundred yards in terms of we can't always have a bus stop outside our front door, and what's the journey between our front door and the bus stop that enables us to use the transport if we can get it uh, designed correctly. We've got some really good schemes, and coming back to Mark's presentation as well, Putting a, changing the toilet in a community centre changes the nature of the journeys people need to make because you can then put services there. So thinking about the places we live and why we're travelling and reducing the need to transport, need to travel, but also just thinking about what's the wider issue around accessibility. Yeah, just from the police perspective, in 2015 there was the launch of the Travel Safe Unit, which was the partnership working which I mentioned earlier, the TFGN Metrolink. Metrolink, can you hear me now? Yeah. Metrolink, uh, Stagecoach and First Boss and the idea of the unit was to, for people to be um, travel safer using public transport. Um, we, put, we put out high visibility patrols, reassurance patrols, 
and uh, tackle antisocial behaviour. We also work with schools and colleges and uh, youth groups. We encourage the young people, you know, how to stay safe when they're travelling and let them know about the consequences of any crime or bad behaviour, you know, that they might undertake when they're travelling. So the Travel Safe Union is there to do the high visibility reassurance patrols to keep uh, the public, sorry, the travelling public safe. And it was also, to be fair, it was, training was a big issue with the table I was sat on, which was eight in the very far corner as well, um, and about whether there was any training or not really. Yeah. Um, so even in the environment that we've talked about, and Andy talked about, about bus services now, they, bus drivers are required, statutory, there has to be a, a period of, of training uh, done every, over a five-year period uh, for, for drivers that does include um, training of, of this sort but it's really down to them to decide how they want to how they have to interpret that commitment they have to be able to be auditable about a level of training for particularly around disability awareness training but also customer service training so that's the same around the country um, I think for me I'd slightly widen it because it's this bit about consistency and, and it's, it's, it's so sad isn't it that then there's some really good practice but it's then let down and you hear we all hear the bad story. I think some of this is about monitoring and lack of monitoring so it isn't just about the training and how often that's done, important though that really is, but what level of inspection of monitoring actually happens and that's the sort of aspect that if I were developing plans around franchising that was mentioned by the, by the Mayor for bus services in areas that we could improve that I think we'd have to up, we'd have to get more uh, inspection, monitoring getting bus drivers to be able to see things perhaps increasingly from, from, a, from a customer's perspective um, and I think it's really important it's not just the sort of what's sometimes been called sheep dip, it's the, the training in, in up front it's, and, and how often that's provided but how is it monitored out on the road um, recognising that of course bus drivers have a really <coughs> difficult job um, and I perhaps just before I hand over say that in the new Metrolink contract which started earlier the, this year uh, I should say now uh, in the summer there's, a, there's a quite a big requirement and expectation for Keolis Amy, who are the new operators of Metrolink for us now, again about customer service training. Um, so the, the training aspects, whether it's entirely consistent, I'm sure it could be improved, but just to reassure, training requirements are there. Um, I think it's also about, is it really applied? Is it applied consistently? And what level of monitoring is needed to really ensure that it is? Um, I think it's bringing an awareness, awareness to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, we do joint operations already with the police and the partners, i.e. your customer service representatives. We've also got the added um, bonus now of um, travel safe officers who are dedicated by Kielos Amy, who provide 900 hours a week. Any training we get from the police, we always invite them to join us as well in relation to customer service hate incidents, how to deal with such things and such crime and how to report it. So we're working together as in the true partnership spirit. And it's also encouraging people themselves you know, not to tolerate anything. And if they feel that they've been abused or mistreated, then it should be reported. There's over um, 30 million tram journeys a year and 203 bus journeys a year. So when you think about the volume of journeys that are made each year, there's very little to crime reporting. Mm. Well, you know, we, we do encourage people if they feel threatened, abused, or intimidated to report it. No perceptions. It's it's a difficult one. This in many ways, because I think there have been some massive improvements. Just thinking about the bus journey I make every day, mm. and just seeing the change in drivers um, from being kind of reluctantly rolling your eyes, sort in, try to get out of the cab to as soon as he puts a bus stop now, seeing somebody perhaps in a wheelchair that needs a ramp down and immediately getting out. And it's the <coughs> consistency across the piece that's massively different. And I think we've got to realistically understand it's part of the free-for-all that Andy mentioned before, that unless a company really wants to do it, they're not going to do it properly or they're going to just take a tick box exercise to it. I think where perhaps to give TFGM some real credit on this is 
where there's been um, kind of investments made, it's been making that a condition of training and, and improving the quality. So some of the kind of quality bus corridors that have been able to put in place where they're there and changing the infrastructure to give buses more priority. The kind of payment back for that was what well, you've got to improve the quality standards. So when they've been able to put quality standards in place, you can see that change in, in the operators. Some of those operators that aren't running on those kind of routes perhaps don't have that, they don't, we've not got the leverage over them. And that's why it's really important that that kind of once in a lifetime opportunity, we've got to take more control over buses. We've got to get it right at the start and make sure the right incentives are in place. I think it's also recognising that there may be better forms of transport for people, and there's, there's only so much bus drivers can do. I'm always um, struck by some of the work we do with community transport operators that have sadly declined over the last few years. There's not many of them as, as there were, and uh, some of the good ones are uh, Mass Community Transport and Easy Go are here, and there's uh, the callers, uh, Wigan and Bolton are kind of still hanging on, but their ability to have drivers leave the bus and help somebody to the front door is not something you get off mainstream transport. So thinking about investments in community transport systems and, and, and that wider range of local journeys is just going to make things easier because you're going to get the right people doing the job rather than try to train people who are just never going to kind of get some of those issues because of the nature of the work they're involved in. So I think there's, 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 there's great opportunities and a good chance to move forward but I think it's thinking about the type of transport and training people for not just trying to make the mainstream transport services fit those demands and training alone isn't going to fix that. From a police perspective, again, and speaking to some people here, again, it's the ASB issues that do arise on occasions on the Metrolink platforms around bus interchanges. Um, again, it's very low in comparison you know, to the crimes that are committed within the community. But, um, as I said, the Travel Safe Unit is about this 50 PCFs have been recruited to the Travel Safe Unit. Again, it's a separate funding from your regular uh, police officers on divisions and covering beats, but we work closely also with the divisions. We link in with the local policing teams and we work in joint operations with them and also with the Metrolink and the bus services as well. But it's to reassure people, you know, if there was a concern, if they bring it forward to us via TFGM or the police, you know, we can deal with it via the local policing teams as well. What's the one thing you might want to change? People reporting incidents, because if they're not reported to us, then we can't act on it. Okay, do people what we really do need to do is, um, from this event, We've already collected this morning on what's age friendly, what's not age friendly, and um, Liz and her colleagues are going to be pulling some of that together in report. I think what we need to do as a programme, uh, Ambition for Aging, is then go to some of our district partnerships where there are steering groups of older people there, look at the projects we're developing. I think we can probably pull together quite a compelling case for some of the things that could be done locally and, and to, to address some of these issues. So clearly, it's using this as a platform for our program to look at the issue of transport and all the experience we've developed over the last uh, two or three years and <coughs> help provide that through the aging hub and partners in Greater Manchester to understand that actually there's some solutions and some of them are actually quite cheap. It doesn't cost anything to, I was going to say, to twist a knobble and set traffic lights, but I'm sure it's probably a computer keyboard involved in changing sequencing, but it's not a lot of money in terms of changing those, uh, those things. So there are things that can be done in the places and we should have good examples that we can present to colleagues in, whether it's in the local authorities or TFGM and, and, and so on. Okay, um, in terms of uh, involvement and engagement, um, I hope we're getting more involved as an organisation in this type of activity. Um, I did see at lunchtime there's a number of um, answers, pre-prepared answers to questions from a previous meeting, um, district by district, this is a Salford one I've got in my hand at the moment. Um, so we'll continue to do that offline, we, we can't do everything in this sort of setting, but my commitment is with the sorts of questions that we've got, if we have to do this in a written form then we will, but it's important that we do provide that accountability and feedback. Um, in terms of uh, my answer to your, your, your question uh, specifically about involving people in decision making, well, um, our experience over the last five-ish years, um, some of this predates me being here, but 
is very positive about something called the Design Disability Design Reference Group, DDRG. Um, and what we're saying, and part of my input is, how can we learn from running that particular group that's had tremendous input, particularly on Metrolink, but also with some of the bus interchanges as well. Um, how can we learn from that as a way of engaging and apply that in other areas, because we seem to be pretty good at that, um, but we ought to do a lot more with other groups as well. Um, and with that in mind, we're currently developing plans about, I think it would be modest to start with, to be honest, but a customer panel. Uh, more broadly that needs to be representative of customers generally that we can use as a reference point uh, a bit like we do for the disability design reference group but more generally and that absolutely needs to pick up older people's needs and we're looking at that at the present time. Um, biggest thing for me to take back from today in addition to the, the comment I made about the fact there's a lot of stuff generally and we'll work that through um, is I picked it up on the table earlier and to some extent in the discussion that's happened since is, is uncertainty uh, at best and at worst confusion about what actually is there and is available. So um, I know it's not perfect, but there's a lot done about Ring and Ride. There was a question about eligibility earlier on for Ring and Ride. Uh, and if people in this room don't know the answer to some of that, um, and about whether what travel vouchers are, how you access them, what they are, um, and the different passes that are, are available now, then it seems to me there's a job of work to do to help communicate with the sorts of groups that you're involved with, many of you, um, to clarify some of that. And, you know, it is, it is quite tricky, but there are a number of things that are available. Travel vouchers, as I said earlier on, I'm unaware of any other metropolitan area in the UK, I can say there's some reasonable uh, certainty that does a travel voucher scheme, doesn't exist in Merseyside, doesn't exist in the West Midlands at all, I can be certain of that because of my involvement previously. Um, you know, it's £30 a year and it gives £120 of vouchers. It's not perfect, but in the mix it's good and GM has something there that other people don't have. And it's a bit like some of the comments about that have been made about getting across the good points and, and making that easier to understand what is available. And I think that's my takeaway from today. How can we as an organisation get out there and make it clearer for, for people about the sorts of things that are there and inevitably in so doing learn a lot of stuff as I've done today about what needs improving. The two things go together really. Thank you.